From Washington, D.C. to the heart of America, welcome to Mark Alford's America. I'm freshman congressman from Missouri, Mark Alford, and I believe in America. I believe in you. And most importantly, I believe that our greatest days are still ahead as a nation. You know, each week we take you behind the scenes to share the stories, the news, legislation, but most importantly, to meet the wonderful, fabulous people that I get the honor of working with each and every week here in Washington. Today, we're talking with a friend of mine, Congresswoman Harriet Hageman. She represents the state of Wyoming, not just one district. Well, it is one district. The whole state is one district. Harriet is dedicated to protecting the constitutional rights of citizens there and really all over the U.S. She went to Casper College, earned both her bachelor's degree and law degree from the University of Wyoming. She was a litigator for 34 years. She opened her own law firm, and of course, she's nationally known for challenging someone uh, that you may have heard of, Liz Cheney. We're going to talk about her in, a, in just a bit. But she's also been challenging a lot of federal overreach, protecting private property rights, fighting against unlawful acts of unelected bureaucrats who some say are running and ruining our great nation. Right now, she's on the House Committee on the Judiciary, also on Natural Resources. She's chair of the Subcommittee on Indian and Insular Affairs. Please welcome to 1516 Longworth, Congresswoman Harriet Hageman. Harry, good to have you here. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm honored to participate well, thank in you. your radio program. In Mark Alford's America. Yes. <laughs> Did you know I have my own little America? People give me <laughs> grief about that sometimes. But what I'm trying to do is just, hey, we've got a, I, I still believe that we have the greatest nation known to man, and we need to promote that. You are part of that. You are part of the positive change in Washington. Um, I want to start with how you got here. Uh, you beat Liz Cheney uh, after, you know, she fell out of favor, basically, with Republicans in the state of Wyoming. Tell me about that. Well, I, I never intended to run for Congress. But after watching Liz Cheney implode and misdirect and redirect her efforts away from representing the citizens of the state of Wyoming and, frankly, all of America to a vendetta against President Trump, I realized that somebody needed to step up who had the background, the knowledge, the information, and the interest in actually representing Wyoming and protecting what you say is the greatest country on planet Earth. Uh, so I often say I, I really wasn't running against Liz Cheney, but I was running for Wyoming, and I think there's a difference. And if you go back and look at my campaign, I was very forward-looking. I was very positive about the state. And I was also very positive and very aggressive about my agenda when I came back to Washington, D.C., and that's what I have attempted to implement over the last 12 months, my agenda. And really, Liz Cheney is in the rearview mirror. I think of her very little, although she is attempting to reclaim some notoriety here recently in pushing her book I am trying to get people interested in her story. I don't think people really are. I think in many ways she really failed Wyoming and failed because we only have one representative. So when she went off the rails, Wyoming for about a year was completely unrepresented because she wasn't interested in addressing Wyoming issues. I don't want to get make this whole thing about Liz Cheney, but I think a lot of people are ticked at her, especially now that she's trying to rewrite history. This whole J6 committee, which was a sham, the way it was organized, produced by a news producer from ABC News to come to a conclusion that was already what they had in mind, what they wanted to present to the American people. They created a narrative, they stuck with it, and that's what they presented in their final report and, as you say, produced their TV drama. It's interesting, the same guy who did the production for J6 also did the production the night that she lost the primary election to me. So, it uh, gives you an idea where she was focused is more on the drama and the TV side of it uh, rather than actually just addressing the issues that Wyoming cares about. Have you had contact with her? No. Did she ever call to concede? Well, she did, but I think that there was a, it was a bad phone call. So all I received was a phone call that said, hi, Harriet, the night of the election, soon after it was called. I never heard anything else. I pointed that out in an interview not long after that. And as uh, she was notorious for, she had taped her own call to me. I didn't receive the message. I was actually accepting the nomination and having my own victory party. But she had taped her the call that she allegedly made to me and then splashed that all over the news that 
she had done a concession speech and I was lying about it, but I never received a concession speech from her. She never reached it out. It doesn't to seem to that. be that important to you. Though. It's not yeah. very important. <laughs> what you're doing now is, you, so you mentioned several times what's important to Wyoming. What is important to Wyoming? So we're one of the largest energy producers in the nation. And the way I put it is that Wyoming makes people's lives better. We produce uh, the vast majority of the coal that is produced in the United States, which accounts for about 25% of the electrical use in the United States is still from coal-fired power plants. We're one of the largest oil and gas producers. We have the highest high quality reserves of uranium in the United States. We're the largest trona producer in the nation. We are one of the top livestock producers, cattle producers, and bison producers in the nation. We have a very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful state. We're the least populated state, uh, 560,000 people. And yes, I represent the entire state. It's 99,000 square miles. I enjoy representing the state. The issues are obviously deregulation. Uh, what we have right now, what has happened to our great country is we have lost the concept of separation of powers. Congress has abdicated its responsibilities for actually legislating, turned over much of it to the unelected bureaucrats here in Washington, D.C. And as a result, we have the EPA and the uh, USDA and the Corps of Engineers and the e Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, all of the federal agencies that have a huge footprint in Wyoming, they are not carrying out the, the, the legislation, the laws as written by Congress, but have essentially gone rogue in many, many different ways. And it with Wyoming and what we do and what we produce and what our industries are, it has an outsized impact and influence on a state like Wyoming. So one of my big issues is attempting to right that wrong and trying to get... How do we do that? Um, there's a couple of ways. One is I think that we need to amend the Administrative Procedure Act, which was adopted in 1946 and has not been amended since that time. But that's really the foundation of the administrative state. And we need to modify the relationship between the executive branch and the, and the legislative branch. The executive branch is only there to carry out the laws, not to write them, but through regulations. I just talked to a gentleman today. We are on track for the second highest number of pages in the Federal Register in U.S. history. The highest was 95,000 pages under Barack Obama. Under Joe Biden, we're at 86,000 pages right now, and I assume we'll get another 10 in there by the end of the year. We're seeing that on the farm uh, bill. We're seeing that in the Ag Committee. These uh, agencies, the bureaucrats, uh, after Congress passes laws, they come back and pass rules, uh, basically interpretation of the laws that we have passed on behalf of the American people and basically kind of do their own thing. Yes, they do. And I would say it, we don't even have to pass the laws for them to come out with their regulations as to what they're going to do. And USDA is an example, since you're on the Ag Committee. USDA is attempting to enforce a mandate on all of our cattle and bison producers mm -hmm. that they have to use electronic identification ear tags. The industry doesn't want it. It's going to have about a $2 billion price tag to our cattle and bison industries. It's astronomically expensive. In a state like Wyoming, it's entirely infeasible. But the USDA is going to try to impose that. Well, Congress never required an EID mandate. Um, we already have the ability to trace livestock. We've been doing it for hundred, hundreds of years. We have brands. We have back tags. We have tattoos. We have ear tags. We have a variety of ways that we already uh, trace and, and identify livestock, and it's been extremely ex effective. We have the highest quality uh, of meat of any country in the world. We have very few disease outbreaks. In fact, where you see a problem with is on the meat side of it, not the cattle side of it, not the livestock side of it, but it's with the packers. That's where the issue is. It's not with the livestock producers. But here's why it's so scary, is this is the, uh, another form of surveillance coming out of a government that's really, really, really interested in surveilling and controlling us right now. And I'll just give you an example of where we're headed if we do this. In I Ireland in 2022, they adopted an EID mandate. About two months ago, they came out and they said that the cattle producers in Ireland are going to have to slaughter 41,000 head of cattle, not because of a disease outbreak, which is what they say. They say we need right. EID for it so that we can trace disease. It's not for a disease outbreak. It's because of uh, their so-called uh, climate crisis. So this is you're seeing this all over the world in these developed countries. You saw it in the Netherlands. You're seeing it in Ireland. But they can't do a slaughter mandate unless they know how many cattle people own and where those cattle are located. So their first. How does it tie into the climate crisis? Because of the methane, the that's, cows are producing. That's, that's what they claim. Flatulence. That's what they claim. Cow farts. Yes. 
Yes. So, so it's it, it's ridiculous. But but this is the way that they control the masses. They've been trying for years to figure out how do we stop people from eating protein. Well, they can't change us. They're not changing the individual. We want beef. We want chicken. We want pork. Yes. Or we want bison. We want that. Uh, so what do they do? They're gonna they're gonna break our cattle and bison producers, and they do it through first EID. And then again, they immediately adopt these kinds of draconian requirements of, well, now you have to slaughter 10% of your herd or whatever the numbers may be. This is a bad idea. We need to stop it in Congress. And uh, I'm hoping to do that. Oh, my goodness. What a fascinating conversation we're having with Congresswoman Harriet Hageman from Wyoming. Hey, there's more to come on Mark Offers America. When we come back, we're going to talk about her work on the Judiciary Committee, the investigation of Hunter Biden and the Biden crime family. Stay with us. Mark Alford's America continues after this. Welcome back, everyone, to Mark Alford's America, where we give you a behind-the-scenes look each week at Washington, D.C., let you meet some of the folks I work with here, helping shape our great nation. Today, we're talking with Congresswoman Harriet Hageman from Wyoming. Great. I actually rode through there a couple of times on my motorcycle from Colorado to South Dakota. Beautiful state. Not a lot of gas stations in between. I had to carry a little gas station in my saddlebag just in case I, I was going to run out, but I didn't run out. Beautiful, though. You went right through the area where I was born and raised. Where was that? I grew up outside of a ranch near Fort Laramie, Wyoming, yeah. which is in the southeastern part of the state. So you would have been on Highway 85, yeah. I assume. And so you went through Lingo where I went to school, where I went to, to high school. What did your folks do? Ranchers. Ranchers. And your mom's still with us, right? My mother just turned 100 a couple of weeks ago. Incredible. She's still pretty active. And, yeah, yeah. 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 She pays a lot of attention to what I'm doing. She has uh, a lot of uh, grandchildren. I come from a very large family. So for Thanksgiving anymore, when we have our big family gets get togethers, so we typically have to go to some kind of a commercial. We have to get the local uh, community center or something because we can't all fit in the house anymore. Yeah. She must be very proud of you. Yeah, she's proud of all of us. That's cool. Uh, all right, so you're on the Judiciary Committee, and of course you guys are investigating the Biden crime family. Most of the listeners of our program are familiar with that. We've talked to numerous people on different committees about this. Jason Smith, Ways and Means, of course, is investigating from a tax standpoint. What are you learning in the Judiciary Committee that leads you to vote for an impeachment inquiry? I think a, a lot of people listening want this president to be held accountable. Uh, he needs to be held accountable. It, the, there, it is the Biden crime family. And what people need to understand is that Hunter Biden is relatively, um, I, I guess you'd say, uh, unimpressive individual. Has no expertise in anything for which he was selling services throughout the world. Has, was earned over $20 million during the, the last couple of, of years, last several years prior to when his father was president, but while his father was vice president, and then while his father was also running for the presidency. And so really there was, there was only one asset that Hunter Biden had to sell, and that was access to his father. So even by his own book during the 2003 to the 2019 period, he was a raging crackhead. He had all kinds of addiction problems. We know from the photographs and things that we've seen from the laptop that this was really a pretty low mor moral person, if you will. He engaged in a lot of really bad acts, including acts that w would open him up and his father up to blackmail. But at the time, he's earning $20 million. He, he didn't have any expertise in Ukrainian employment law or oil and gas contracts or anything else. These countries, many of whom are not friends of the United States, Kazakhstan, Romania, China, the Chinese Communist Party, and we know about the situation with Ukraine, they were paying him massive amounts of money. For what? Nothing other than access to his father. And that's why we have to continue with this, with this inquiry. Um, we are fully aware. There, the, the documentation is there showing that there is money that went directly from Hunter Biden to Joe Biden. But the left says there's nothing there. Well, that's because they're, it's wishful thinking and they keep thinking they can shove this under the rug. And with the help of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the mainstream media, they are able to basically keep this story off of the front page, which is really pretty stunning because I would argue this is, is the most incredible tale of corruption 
of a government official in the history of the United States. I believe that this president is the most compromised president in U.S. history. So you not only have the bribery side of it, which clearly it was, th this was bribery. They set up over 20 shell companies, LLCs, that they would pour money from one shell company into another shell company, into another shell company. Those companies weren't selling services. They were not selling a product. They were not selling shoes. They were selling one thing, and that is access to Joe Biden. And they put the kids and the grandkids' names on all of these LLCs, yet they had no management responsibilities. They weren't doing anything for these countries, for these malign actors, except providing access to Joe Biden. I don't think that there's any doubt in the world we're going to be able to show bribery uh, related to this, and that is an unimpeachable offense. But we also have to th think about it, and I think this is even scarier, and that is to what extent is our national security and our foreign policy being dictated by the actions of Joe Biden's son and the extent to which he was compromised by these various countries. We know that China was able to traverse the entirety of the United States of America with a spy balloon. We know that there are many unanswered questions related to why China is not being held accountable related to COVID-19. We look at the amount of money that went from the Chinese Communist Party to Hunter Biden. It is just stunning. We know that they were not paying taxes on this money. So if you go back and you look at some of the hearings we've had in judiciary questioning of Christopher Wray and Mary Garland and these folks, and, and what you find is that our government itself has been compromised because Hunter Biden is so compromised, Joe Biden is so compromised, the family itself is so compromised. And here we have a situation where there are incredibly serious and important decisions being made based upon those family activities. What's the potential ramifications of that? I mean, here we have Xi Jinping, who because of Biden's weakness already shown in Afghanistan, Xi Jinping's breathing down the neck of Taiwan. You got Putin, the madman aggressor, who's invaded Ukraine and possibly has got his eyes on the Balkans, Moldova, and God forbid, Poland after that. What are the ramifications of this compromise of the president of the United States? Well, you've mentioned China and the risk that they pose to Taiwan, but there is also the entire Pacific Ocean. And right now we have an arrangement. We have our territories in the South Pacific, and then we also have what are called the Camp Compacts of Free Association with three other island chains, Micronesia, Palau, and the, and the Marshall Islands. And we're entering into arrangements with those island chains so that we can be sure to make to keep the fishing lanes and the lanes open in the Pacific Ocean so that China is not able to control, although we know that they're trying to in the South China Sea so that they can't control that. But we know that China engages, for example, in illegal fishing. We know that they are that there are a variety of things that China is doing that are not in the best interests of the United States. Stealing our technology. They steal our technology all kinds of things, and yet we don't have anybody to hold them accountable because they know they have the goods on Hunter Biden. They have information. They gave him a $5 million loan. Now, it was a loan that had no, no it did not need to be paid back, and there was no deadline by which it needed to be paid back. I love that kind of loan. And they did it for a couple of reasons. One is that it wouldn't be considered taxable income. Right. So he skated on not having to pay the taxes on it. But the other thing is when you are as compromised as Hunter Biden is and as Joe Biden is, and you're sitting there and you owe $5 million, and this is a guy who's in his 30s, 40s, and 50s calling dad saying, hey, dad, can you put another 18 grand in my account? Because I got to go do whatever when he's, you know, spending $800,000 on prostitutes, but asking daddy when he's in his 40s for additional money, and he's got a $5 million, quote, loan from China. Does anybody really believe he's going to do whatever it takes to not have to pay that money back when he doesn't have the money to pay it back? So there's all kinds of things that demonstrate how he was compromised, Joe Biden was compromised. I believe our national and international policy has been compromised. I believe these are clearly bribes. People want to say, well, it doesn't show that the money went into Joe Biden's account. Well, number one, it does. But number two, if you are benefiting his children and his family members, that is still considered benefiting him. It's a ridiculous standard that they're attempting to impose simply because it's the Bidens. What do you like best about America? Freedom, liberty, the ability to come here and be a success story the way that we are. 
you know, I grew up in very humble beginnings and went to Casper College, a community college on a livestock judging scholarship, was able then to go on and get my bachelor's and my law degree, and now I'm sitting in Congress. It's story only That story only happens in America. Well, Harriet, I'm proud to have you as a friend. I enjoy spending time with you and John, your husband, and Alessia and I, we've had dinner together, and it's so cool to be here to help shape our great nation, but also to get to know people like you. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, folks, thanks again for joining us for Mark Alford's America. We'll talk again next week. Until then, remember, I believe in you. I believe that our base days are still ahead of us, and I believe in America.